Hello, interwebs. Are we live? Is it working this time? This is our second attempt. Are things looking any differently? We are waiting now, uh, overcoming technical difficulties here in the No Force One studios at our undisclosed Dallas area bug out location. And we just tried going live and it didn't work at all. And now we are, all right, it's working. We are live. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Adam versus the man, Coronaphobia day 10. I am joined in studio today in No Force One with Samantha Morgan Miller, Carnivore. Kokesh, Freedom, and David Dunlap Clover, and we will be watching your comments and bringing them to you throughout the show today, so please stay active and engaged. David and Samantha are both looking at the comments as we're going live, and if any of you say something smart enough or interesting enough or ask enough questions, they will be read on the air, so thank you for being a part of this active and engaged audience, and right now, especially in this time of crisis, it is especially important that we grow this conversation that is based on principle and ethics and questioning authority and having a calm, cool, collected way of going about things. So please, if you're watching right now, share this video. Facebook censorship is a real problem, and it is, well, it's, it's pretty awkward. I got a lot of mixed feelings about, hey, we're doing this show on Facebook to begin with. Of course, it gets posted on YouTube afterwards as well, and Brighty on everywhere else that uh, we, we can afford with our limited volunteer time to get it up there. Big shout out to Joey Lee, GI Mary Jane, who's been helping with production remotely, getting those videos videos distributed to other platforms absolutely critical especially right now again so if you're watching this if you're just sitting there watching me I mean I, I don't know what else are you doing are you just are you just sitting there on, on the couch eating or uh, what I don't know playing Pokemon go is that you can't play Pokemon go if you're on lockdown oh my gosh what are what are they gonna do um, but they are tracking your phone location data. So we have a lot of really important stories today. We got a couple big announcements. We're gonna go over the history of uh, uh, similar uh, pandemics to what we are experiencing now. We're gonna be talking about our coronavirus bug out tour and uh, a bit about the Libertarian National Convention. We got some updates there. So while you're watching this, if you're just sitting there, share it right now while you're watching, click share. Put it in your page uh, or on your profile, on, your, on whatever pages you might have access to, groups, things like that. And, and, and I don't want to say this, hey, well, share my stuff so I can dominate the conversation. No, be an active, engaged participant in the conversation right now, one way or another. If you see other content that's important to share, share that too. But it's really critical for people like me to be able to beat the censors and get the message out that we have people actively sharing and getting people engaged. That's why we're doing the show the same time seven days a week you know I'm gonna be here giving you the daily updates what you need to know tracking the crisis everything else about what's critical going on in the world right now uh, as we used to say on Adam versus the man the news and what to do about it anchoring the internet seven days a week so first uh, our big announcement is that we are going home to the Garden of Freedom in Ash Fork or near Ash Fork Arizona Juniper Wood Ranch and we have uh, a, a announcement with that uh, it's on my Facebook from this morning scroll down if you want to read that and see some of the details I'm about to go over with where we're gonna be when and what we're doing but first for everybody's benefit to know our our quarantine situation and uh, what, what we're uh, doing for appropriate uh, safety precautions right now is that uh, we are in a state of self quarantine. Uh, well, Ryan Miller, if you're on TikTok, wave your hand so we know not to follow you. <laughs> yes, I'm on TikTok now. Follow me on TikTok also. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Those are those are my, my five uh, primary platforms right now. So please check all those out. Join the email list as well. So we are on a, uh, a voluntary self-quarantine, which means that we are going to be uh, limiting our contact with other people to what's essential. And again, this essential thing is uh, really dangerous when government gets to decide what's essential. One of my favorite memes so far to come out of this, not a funny one, not a politically critical one, except in the really deeper, scarier sense, uh, our friend Daniel Hayes, who is organizing the Libertarian National Convention, hopefully still in Austin, uh, May 21, 25 this year, just took us, and he's not uh, a Jewish guy himself, but he took a photograph of a Star of David, you know, the fabric ones they actually used to make Jews wear in Nazi Germany and just wrote non-essential on it. Yeah, read into that as you will. But we are making uh, you know, the decision that uh, you know, if, if we're gonna go out, 
Uh, if we're going to be interacting with anybody, at least until Saturday, and that's our, our two weeks, 14-day quarantine uh, day from when we may have been exposed at the, uh, the Illinois Libertarian Convention uh, in Peoria. Great event. And, and I, I still think it was great that they went ahead with that. But uh, as people who are going to be out traveling and interacting with people, we, we've decided that the, the safe thing is to give ourselves that two-week window of self-quarantine. And so if we're going to be interacting with other people, we are going to go out wearing, uh, wearing bandanas, looking, looking like bad guys, because we don't have masks. Although there is, a, there is a possibility, by the way. I don't have my black one today. I got my blue one. Normally I'm wearing like all blue and it's all color coordinated in a very important fashion statement. I mean, just because we're in the middle of the apocalypse doesn't mean we can't have fashion and be color coordinated. But uh, we have a, we have an opportunity to buy some masks, actually. Uh, we're going to come back to that because, if you don't know, uh, I've been an importer from China, uh, importing books uh, for, for freedom. So if... Uh, we have the opportunity, we might be delivering a lot of face masks here to the United States where they are most needed. So for the next uh, at least few days until Saturday, uh, anytime that we have to be sharing any kind of airspace or, you know, immediately, you know, physically uh, present with people, we're going to be wearing the, uh, we're going to be wearing bandanas. And if we're touching stuff that other people are going to be touching, we, you know, we wear gloves and, you know, engage in that physical distancing, not social distancing. We are still especially engaged digitally as always, bringing you these shows every day and uh, communicating as, as we need to. But, you know, we're making that, uh, you know, kind of decision. Is, is, is it worth it? And, and during this time, we're probably going to be driving down to San Antonio. So, uh, you know, we're going to be we're gonna have to stop and get gas and before we get out of the bus it's gonna be gloves and bandanas and it's sort of essential because it's worth it for us you know we get to make that decision um, what we're gonna be doing then to go home from San Antonio we're gonna be doing uh, a little tour to collect supplies and people because I know there are a lot of people out there right now who are scared of their current situation and uh, they, they they're just uncomfortable living in a big city or wh wherever it is they'd uh, rather just go camping for a few weeks if they need to and or they've got uh, just being out of work uh, an opportunity and they want to put their time towards a good cause. We're going to be helping people out in our community in Juniper Wood Ranch. There are a lot of elderly people living off grid out there who are going to need people running supplies. So we want to be able to help them out with all that. That's a big part of this. You know, I'm doing this because uh, I, well, there were a couple of things. The logistics finally fell into place. We're, we're pretty sure, certain now that the Libertarian Party of Texas State Convention scheduled for mid-April isn't going to be happening, at least uh, not as more than a virtual convention or a convention where they have, you know, if, if it's gatherings of 10 or less are allowed, they might have 10 people and, and live stream, uh, you know, that, that meeting with 10 people. So that's uh, one possibility, and hopefully we'll still get to do a remote debate hosted by the Texas Libertarian Party. Very much looking forward to that. And I am expecting that in Austin we are going to be able to gather for the Libertarian National Convention. Now, it might not be Austin. It might not be city limits. If there are stricter restrictions there, we might have to gather just outside of city or county limits or, uh, you know, do something else for, for a venue. So it's looking, uh, it's, it's looking like it... It's going to probably be modified, but I, I, I'm pretty certain, and, and you know, uh, there's actually one big reason it might not happen at all, and I'm going to come back to that, some scary possibilities we're seeing in the news today, but it, it, bearing that, or barring that uh, rare scenario where things get radically worse, uh, we are going to be going ahead with the Libertarian National Convention somewhere around Austin, hopefully in, in May. But until then, we've got about two months, and we don't really want to be just floating around in the bus because it is kind of dangerous in these times of uh, unpredictability from law enforcement. Like we saw with the story we brought you from Cincinnati yesterday, the police department there actually announced that they aren't going to be sending officers in person to uh, respond to a number of uh, types of calls, including assaults without injury, burglaries, home invasions, things of that nature. So the legitimate services of public safety and criminal accountability that 
U.S. law enforcement might be providing might not be there. Extra crackdowns might be there. Checkpoints might be there. So we want to get this done as quickly as possible and get home, but we also want to make sure that we're stocked up and supplied and, and comfortable sitting out there for a couple months, you know, and, and, and maybe just taking off uh, in time to get to Austin in, uh, in late May. So let's see. Within that, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we want to gather for supplies. Uh, we are down three miles of private dirt road, and one of the advantages of my place as a bug out spot is that it, it, uh, it, you can't find it even if you have the address. Google Maps actually will send you somewhere else, and that's one of the great benefits of uh, being so extremely out there. Uh, we are in the middle of three small towns uh, that have uh, groceries and gas, and so we're pretty confident that being able to do supply runs while we're out there is not gonna be that much of a challenge, but we still wanna make sure that when we get out there, we have enough uh, just to get by. If we had to survive with, uh, with whoever's out there with us in terms of MREs and water and, and, and things like that. So if you want to help out with that, please, you can donate. You saw the PayPal link is there in the announcement down below. We also have uh, Bitcoin and uh, B BTC and BCH receiving addresses. So anything you guys can contribute to that would be much appreciated. We're building a team. In a way, we're rebuilding Adam versus the man right now because we don't get to tour. We don't get to go to Libertarian Party events. We want to make sure that we are maximizing our effort as a team, not just on getting around and paying for logistics, but sitting in one place and producing the best media that we possibly <laughs> can so if you're if you're looking for an adventure with the best bug out team in America if you want to be a part of this please send me an email Adam at the Freedom Line most importantly check out the uh, oh Sam is showing me my shot has got some stuff in the top all right is that better babe thank you yeah I'm oh yeah we got a lag here on the video of course um, it's really one of the fun quirks of doing Facebook like this. It doesn't show you on my screen, or doesn't show me on my screen, what you guys are actually seeing. Um, so if you want to be a part of this, please send me an email. We are going to be going through, so we're going to go down to, to San Antonio, get some work done on the RV tomorrow, because we want to make sure that at least everything in the RV is safe for this drive and that we have uh, the electricity working again in, in, the, uh, in the coach part of the RV before we get out off grid. Then we are going to be coming through Austin and Dallas areas uh, on uh, Saturday, and then Denver on Sunday, Phoenix, Monday, San Diego, Tuesday, and Wednesday will be in Los Angeles and Las Vegas before heading home to Juniper Wood Ranch. So if anybody wants to be a part of that, again, please email me. And uh, if, you, if you can donate supplies at any point along the way, we would appreciate that as well. Uh, anything else before we jump right into the headlines? We've got a, we got a lot going on here. Yeah. Yeah? All right, here we go. So, just did a, a uh, debate with Stephen Ritchie from Hawaii, another Libertarian Party presidential candidate, and fun little headline here, we have found that in Hawaii, they have essentially a tourist ban happening. Now, this is a really just interesting wrinkle in the response to the coronavirus and government overreaction. If you fly into Hawaii today, you might have thought you were going for a one-week vacation, Nope, you are going to be locked down for two weeks, 14 days. If you go to Hawaii right now, your vacation has been turned into a hotel stay. And yeah, isn't that, isn't, yeah, you didn't know, I, nobody else here knew that. That's, because that, this isn't like mainstream headlines. We should have gone to Hawaii. Yeah, right. So one of the things that, that I think is especially valuable about this show and why I hope you'll share it is that, you know, I'm not just reading the Drudge Report and, and aggregating the important headlines and highlighting what's important for you all to know about, but with Sam and David watching the headlines and everybody else who's sharing stuff with me, especially on Twitter right now, um, we are able to bring you some of these stories that, that uh, are the, just just below the radar, important wrinkles that you really need to know about to understand what's going on. So in Hawaii, and by the way, here in, in Dallas, oh my God, it is hot and humid in the No Force One studios today. If uh, if you go to Hawaii, you, your vacation is canceled. That's, and this is a really interesting just wrinkle that we have to consider when you guys are making plans. And, and I think looking out ahead for about about two months right now and i don't just say that because that's when the libertarian national convention is but everything that we're seeing about the curves and government policy and the desire to roll things back right now well, since people are 
really undeniably feeling the uh, the economic crunch. Um, sorry, I keep getting distracted by stuff going on in the background here. But uh, the other, what was the other story related to that that we wanted to cover? Oh, yeah, so about governments pulling back, there was a story from Park County, uh, Utah, the health officer there, no, Park County, Colorado, saying that uh, the, the stay-at-home order should be should be lifted, that, that people should be going about their lives as normal. And I, you know, I got, I got to call out my brother here, Andrew Kokesh. He's a, uh, he's a, uh, psychiatric nurse in Washington state, still going to work at, at his facility. They're doing temperature scans at the door, which as you know, is a very limited measure of protection in terms of stopping the spread. Because if everything they're telling us is true, you can be contagious for a period of time before coming down with symptoms and a period of time after showing symptoms, hypothetically, up to 37 days. Now, I don't know if I believe that. I, we saw that as a data point. I would say it's pretty limited or an extreme outlier, but uh, you know, not unreasonable to believe when they say that it can be alive on surfaces for 17 days, that uh, there's a much longer period when it's contagious outside of when you might be showing a fever. But uh, he's, he's conducting his work, seeing patients. He deals with a lot of people in, uh, you know, compromised mental health situations where it's, it's pretty essential. I mean, if you cut them off from this service because of the coronavirus, People are going to be in uh, much more difficult situations than, than what we would expect with possible exposure. For them, they've decided there that it's worth the risk. So he was saying that he would recommend uh, telling people to follow government, uh, government edicts right now. And I was like, well, which ones? And I, I love my brother. He's definitely a, a libertarian, definitely an ethical person who believes in, you know, don't hit, don't steal, don't kill. Doesn't matter if you're a government agent. Uh, but he doesn't have the same, you know, depth of knowledge that uh, some of us have as, as passionate activists, engaged libertarians who read too many books and are constantly in the news. And so... Um, oh, Charles Eakins. Hey, Andrew, I'm in Washington State also. Okay, well, hey, uh, Andrew, we're, well, I don't want to, I don't want to give up uh, any more of my brother's personal information if he doesn't want to be included too much in this broadcast. But just to make this point, right now, trust in government has got to be at an all-time low. When you see government so blatantly contradicting itself, you see the president and, and Pelosi and Dr. Fauci standing next to him saying all different things. Uh, we just shared a meme on, on Instagram today, and, and some of you might have seen the video clip from Trump's press conference a few days ago when he, he, he mentioned uh, the deep state department, and, and Anthony uh, Fauci, the doctor, stand next to him goes like this, and actually is like trying to you know hide his face. And the meme is, when you say something so stupid that even the infectious disease expert touches his face. And that's one of the things that is important to keep in mind here if you are in a position where you might be exposed to the virus or touching stuff or around someone, wash your hands before you touch your face. You know, not that complicated. Something that, uh, you know, we should all be trying to do anyway. You know, and I do this when I go to events, uh, shaking hands with libertarians and, 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 and other uh, people in political situations. You know, if I go to the bathroom even, I wash my hands sometimes before and after. I mean, if you go out after, I mean, do you really want do you really want me to get graphic on this? No, but if we want to jump ahead to getting graphic, there's nothing I could say about shaking hands and then getting other people's germs on your dick that could possibly be worse than what we just saw come out of the New York City Health Department yesterday, where they specifically said, stop licking each other's buttholes, you're spreading the coronavirus. I am not making that up. I wish that was a joke. Like, I really wish that was a joke. It's, it's on my news feed. Put it everywhere. Check this out. Uh, it is just part of their directive because they assume that, hey, stay six feet apart from other people. Uh, we have to explain that that includes not licking their buttholes. Like, really? But yeah, basic conscientiousness about sanitation procedures, just good hygiene, all of that's important right now, of course. But I gotta point out, the, the really, what for me is the top story came from, of all places, Al Jazeera. 
and Al Jazeera did a story about the data and maybe the virus isn't as deadly as they say, looking around at different countries, comparing their experiences, and in Germany, where they have one of the best te testing regimes and some of the best data analysis, and generally a, a pretty accountable government. Uh, it's not like, the, like you know, if, I, I, I don't know, if someone wants to question me on this, let me know in the comments, but you know, uh, if there was a spectrum of, you know, if, if you're going to have a government, it's transparent and it's accountable right here. You know, in the United States, you go, oh, they're doing shit in secret. By the way, one of our headlines today is that the Pentagon is not going to be revealing all the data about the tests going on with the troops. And I'll tell you why that's so dangerous. You know, th th then you have the Chinese government way down here. I think the German government is somewhere up on that scale. And the big news, and this was like, this is like the buried headline in the Al Jazeera story, is that the fatality rate in Germany is point three percent i hate to say i told you so but i told you so and i love saying i told you so when it means that less people are gonna die this is just so important in dispelling the hysteria and the coronaphobia around this is that the death rate comes into perspective. I'm kind of disappointed that, that more people aren't seeing through the statistical manipulation here that is so obvious. I mean, it's out there all over social media, at least maybe, maybe it's just in my social media bubble, but it, it, if they say the fatality rate is this, but it's super viral and super contagious and most people have and don't have symptoms, everybody's going, well, how many people got it and never showed symptoms and never got hospitalized? And so what they're showing is the percentage of people who have been tested and saying that's the, that's the fatality rate. But, you know, if a thousand people get it and only a hundred show symptoms and those are the ones that get tested and only one of those dies, you're going to say, oh, Wow, one out of 100 who gets it dies. That's a fatality rate of 1%. That's like 10 times the flu. That's pretty serious. But if 1,000 of them got it and 900 of them got tested, it, what it really means is that 0.1%, and now you're back at the level of the flu. And what I've been saying for a while now is that even the government estimate of it being 1% and saying that, yeah, it's got to come down a little bit, the 3.4 is too high, things like that, it's going to come down somewhere in the range of 0.3.5% pretty quickly here. So already, I'm, we're at the low range of that with Germany at 0.3. I mean, let's celebrate. This thing is not as bad as they've been telling us. And now we know statistically that it's not from the data. Now, I could be wrong. I could be making some assumptions here. And one of them would be maybe people of a Germanic ethnicity are somehow more impervious to the virus than people of Italian ancestry seems like a pretty big stretch. I don't think that's the case. Now, there could be a little bit of variation there, but obviously we're seeing a lot of data manipulation here. Now, another important statistical thing that hit the news today from Oxford University in the United Kingdom. They have said that 50% of the population of Britain may have it already. So the containment didn't work, being able to keep people at their jobs, keeping the economy strong, allowing the people in the market who are gonna to respond to those incentives focus on taking care of people who really need it, as I've been saying from the beginning, is the best strategy here. And that's what's getting out uh, with these most recent data analyses. So. The big wrinkle here, and this came out of that story from the UK, is, uh, well, sorry, one other thing, antibody testing. And this is what we're going to need to finally get a real statistical analysis of how bad and how deadly this is. And what antibody testing is, is if you've had the virus, your immune system creates antibodies. Uh, this is how they do the HIV test, by the way. And in a, with the case of HIV, they know that, yeah, it sticks around and you show antibodies and they test for the antibodies. You go, okay, so you've got your body reacting. That's how they know you have it. With the coronavirus, you, your body creates these antibodies antibodies and then they're still in your immune system you have that resistance now it's not perfect immunity but generally generally speaking this is how viruses work you've heard about chicken pox and shingles like this right you get them once you never get them again and if anything uh, you want to get it as a child because it's generally milder in children so maybe the answer for coronavirus how we do it is <laughs> give it to everybody when they're young so that as they get older it's never going to be an issue for them they've got those antibodies and they're able to resist it later. So when we get widespread antibody testing, what we'll be able to show is how many people got it 
and would have never tested positive for because right now the test for coronavirus is not like the HIV test. They're testing for the actual virus, not antibodies. And so what this Oxford study was showing is when we get that broader population analysis with antibody testing, we'll be able to see how many people just beat this thing like it was no big deal. Like you got the virus, you created the antibodies and, and your body didn't even notice. So you didn't even notice. It was like this, this, this just insignificant health event. Okay, so now it's one of the bugs living in your body. Uh, I don't know, we should have these numbers, but it, we all live with this, right? How many, how many, how many microbes and viruses and, and flu and cold uh, bugs do we have in the average human being at any given time? It's a lot. Now, one of the interesting phenomena that you start to appreciate out of this is what we represent now as a global interconnected human family like never before if a virus like this comes up again now we see that it's going to spread very quickly we are just such a, a, in such a globally connected world that uh, you know what are your what's your degree of separation given how much people are flying uh, between major cities all over the world how many people in the world out of what seven billion come into contact with someone who's been on an airplane uh, you know, within a month's time, is it 80, 90 percent of the population? That's the that's the main part of the human petri dish, and in a sense, we're all part of that. And there is a sort of implied collective in this. If you choose to interact with other human beings, you're part of the big human family petri dish, and we all have to accept that that's part of what it means to be a human being right now. Now, you can isolate yourself, you can have your own cell, uh, your family perhaps, you and a spouse, sex partners, that sort of thing, uh, people whose buttholes you lick if you're from New York. But if you're in that situation where I wanna protect myself, you can still isolate yourself, but this is the reality of what it means to be a human being on Earth today with this size of a population. So, one of the stories that Sam brought to my attention this morning is that we have a new virus in China. Now, before we get to the details of that, here's what's scary about this. What the governments of the world have shown is that when a minor health crisis like this occurs, they are able to clamp down and really increase their power, rip people off, and just... All the things that we're seeing all over the world, lockdowns, shutdowns, martial law, uh, businesses being barred from opening, uh, the, the $2 trillion bailout, I mean, it's it's absolutely insane. That just got voted on this morning. I don't think it's finally passed. Is it, is it waiting for Trump to sign it now? It's waiting for, waiting for the House. Senate. No, the, I think the Senate vote and they're waiting for the House at this point. Okay. Uh, it could be the other way. It could be another version. I don't really track these things that closely. It's not worth uh, you know, examining the knife in your back when you can talk about pulling it out. But we are keeping an eye on that. And it does look like a huge, ridiculous pork barrel spending bill with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for this agency, that agency, all the little pet projects. It looks like every member of Congress who said, well, I'll vote for it if you put in another $10 million for my thing, then they got it. So the new virus, this is the threat. Now, if government knows that every time there's a health crisis of this nature, they can get away with all of this shit, then you're going to see more of these crises, right? So, Sam, tell us about this uh, this new virus from China, please. It's called the Hanta virus. It's got a fatality rate of 30. Hanta or Hanta? H-A-N-T-A. Hanta. Whatever. <laughs> A fatality rate of 36%. It has the same symptoms as the coronavirus plus muscle aches. Well, muscle aches is part of corona officially, isn't it? Flu, fluey body aches? Or is that joint? They're not saying mu so muscle aches being muscle, like, distinct from flu-like ache yeah, system, like, symptoms that are more joint focused. Yeah. So um, wow. it was brought to the attention, it was brought to the media attention when a man in China died from it last night. First death reported. Allegedly. Allegedly. See, this is where, if we are one big human petri dish right now, we really have to stand up to tyranny all over the world. Uh, I think MLK said an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere, but now, like never before, is that injustice capable of literally going viral? And the injustices that we've seen out of China with the suppression of uh, statements from doctors, anything that conflicts with the official Chinese government narrative, there are a lot of problems with the lack of transparency there, putting other people's health at risk all over the world. And right now, the greatest way that we're experiencing that is through lack of knowledge about 
about the coronavirus, particularly lack of information about treatment. And we have a lot of uh, potential treatments out there that obviously are getting, um, getting, uh, uh, can I say retarded if I mean it in the literal sense? They are getting, uh, you know, suppressed and, and held back by government policy. That would be an appropriate word. It would be a pro wouldn't would. It would. Okay, yes. so yes, these That's efforts are being means. retarded by the government. Yes. They are being held back. Um, so I don't I don't keep up with what the kids so consider PC. PC or not these yeah. days. Not that I really give a fuck, but this problem with getting the information out if we really see ourselves as this human family and this uh, global petri dish we really need to make sure that we're not holding back information so again rumors of uh what trump mentioned the other day uh what is it chloroquine chloroquine what, what chloroquine it? phosphate chloroquine phosphate and a man actually died um, yeah, important story here. There was yeah. a man in Fl Florida man. Florida man died because he looked at what he was cleaning his aquarium with, and it had an ingredient in it that sounded like chloroquine, and it might have just been a, a different chemical derivative with that in the name, and he ended up dying. So in experience experimenting with these treatments, yeah, it, it's uh, you got to be careful. Consult with medical professionals, although. We did see some stories also just on the level of individual testimonials where people who have been given chloroquine treatments under the supervision of doctors have had amazing results. So we might actually already have pretty close to a cure for this thing that would take the death rate down to near zero. So I've considered that even with the best case scenario given our plans and, and, and our logistics and our timing going back and bugging out uh, with our apocalypse team at, uh, at the Garden of Freedom, that uh, they're not going to be able to keep this up for too long unless, you know, this new virus gets out. The other, uh, you know, sort of rumored... Let me, uh, I'm going to interrupt you and rephrase that. It's not a new virus. It's Thank just you. Yes. Hit, it's just hit media attention recently because it's being right. described as similar to the corona. Yeah, I should the say a new is... viral phenomenon or new virus panic. Well, the, I mean, it's been in the U.S. before. It's not. Oh, the haunt of virus is yeah. not a new thing at all. It's, not it's just new. a new, it's a new media occurrence of it. Phenomenon, and people are hyping it up like a new version. Ah, uh, okay. So to my point, thank thank you for that. That's a very important clarification. Uh, th so to my point now that that the government could just use anything uh, that, that that has this kind of fear attached to it to do everything that they're doing now. So the the other rumored treatment that we've heard to be effective is uh, large doses of intravenous vitamin C. And uh, different reports about that, again, just anecdotal. But who knows, maybe if we had all of the anecdotal data collected in one place, if governments weren't keeping that a secret from us, maybe then we could find out what the best treatment is a lot sooner and save a lot of lives. But government doesn't really care about that, obviously. And I don't, man, I gotta say, this is so discrediting of the old parties to see how they are just taking advantage of the situation to rip us off. Even before, like we brought you the stories of Senator Burr and Leffler insider trading because they saw that the market crash was coming and while they told their constituents that everything was under control, oh yeah, we're going to dump our stocks and, and, and make a ton of money. So to the U.S. military, and this is really important, the Pentagon, even the Pentagon has a shortage of test kits right now. They are only testing first responders and medical personnel. So they did report a few of the individual cases from around the world, but now Today, Defense Secretary Mark Esper came out and said they are going to be keeping their data secret. That should be really disturbing to anyone, but they're saying that this is because they don't want the rest of the world to know that our military might be vulnerable. How insane is that? They are putting the lives of our service members and, more importantly, their family members at risk by making this data secret. And they know, they absolutely know, this is going to have almost zero impact on military readiness. There aren't military personnel in combat roles over the age of 60 who might die or get serious symptoms with the coronavirus. The, the, the insanity of this, again, it's in the open now, the secrecy around this. And just to go back, Donald Trump directed the CDC 
to do its deliberations in private. So another story about this that describes the vulnerability that we have right now that is being exposed in this crisis is the American immigrant population, or rather the illegal alien population here in the United States, estimated by some to be around 13 million people. If you are not here with a legal status, you are going to be in a difficult situation when it comes to getting treatment for coronavirus symptoms. Certainly, you're not going to be willing to go in and get tested tested and say, well, now I'm on a database and they know where to find me. And if I test positive, they might deport me or, or worse, you never know, put you in a cage. Whereas uh, if, if you didn't have that threat, you know, and maybe if Trump really cared about public health, he would issue a moratorium on, uh, on, uh, uh, deportation, or he would, uh, you know, do something that could make uh, people who are here illegally say that you can get testing anonymously, that you can come in and say you're going to get tested or treated without having to give an ID. And I think that would go a long way to reducing this problem. But the vulnerability is we have 13 million people who are here, who are part of America, who are part of this population, part of this national community, who are exposed to other people who aren't in that status. And if they're getting around as carriers and they're not able to get treatment, it's it's going to have a lot of uh, disastrous effects. So uh, any comments you guys want to share here? Oh, oh, Elizabeth Dennison, in response to what I said about the possible treatments, ozone therapy is also a possible treatment. It's non-toxic and fairly inexpensive. And she says, uh, see Dr. Robert J. Rowan's Facebook page. And yeah, I watched, uh, someone emailed me this video. I hope, it, I don't know if it was you, Elizabeth. I, I'm sorry. I didn't get a chance to respond. I watched it right before the show. I really should have remembered that for this. Uh, but yeah, two and a half minute video of him explaining how he went to Africa uh, with his partner in the middle of the Ebola crisis and used ozone treatment to successfully cure uh, five out of five patients they dealt with there, never came down with it themselves, and uh, want to be able to apply this to treat the coronavirus, of course. The people who want to keep this crisis going as long as possible right now are going to be doing everything they can to stifle the effect. Hey, I believe my brother is watching. I see his icon. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. I was just telling people a little bit about you know, your situation situation with, with your work in, uh, in, the, in the Seattle area and the uh, safety protocol that, that your office has taken on. So, if you, Andrew, if you would, if you want to add anything to that, please write us a comment. I'll read it on the air in just a minute here. So, uh, Sam, David, anything else we, we want to interject at this point? You, are, uh, you already had up on them. Okay. I incidentally answered all the questions. Yeah, the ones that I had saved here. Okay. Anything, David? Anything uh, you want to bring? Charles Eakin says ozone is toxic in large doses. Uh, I'll try one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take two, <laughs> two ozones, <laughs> three ozones. Fine. What? All of them. For all the ozones. All the ozones. Give me all the ozones. <laughs> Give me the part that doesn't have a hole in it. All right. So Andrew has already commented here. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, he says disease tracking is an important part of controlling the spread of a pandemic. Absolutely. Uh, can't really be done anonymously. Well, mm, Andrew, I think you're right that you lose something uh, with, with the anonymity. But let me ask you, as a healthcare professional, wouldn't you want someone who is, is here as an illegal immigrant to be able to get testing without having their legal status questioned or compromised? Now, you can't track them after that, but you can still track the data point. And that's, that, if, they, if you don't give them that, you get no data from them. If you don't let someone come in and get tested without getting tracked, and followed afterwards. I mean, you could give them a number and say, look, we're only going to identify you as a number. If you can help us continue to collect data in your case, we'd appreciate that. And let them go home without being on a database with their name and identity. At least you get that data. If you say you can't come in, they don't get tested. Now you get no data at all. So I think it can be done anonymously. All right, Andrew, we're still putting ourselves uh, in the front lines, well, maybe medium lines and providing health care to those who are still seeking it. Yeah, and Andrew, I got to give you props, really, uh, for just no question saying, yeah, we're, we're going to go back to work because what my brother does, and, and Andrew, I didn't want to say too much about what you do or identify any of the, I didn't even identify the exact suburb you're in, but if, if you want to talk about any of that, if you want to share, I think my audience would appreciate uh, knowing a little bit more about, about your situation, what you're doing, and, and why you think that is, uh, is an essential uh, function right now that should be compromised by any of the stay-at-home orders. So Andrew says, yeah, totally agree. The xenophobia that Trump is pushing makes people too fearful to get tested, which is very much a separate problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. 
uh, Marcus O'Heffernan, what comes first, the doing in an economy or the abstract monetary unit units that represent slash record slash annotate the doing? Hey, so that reminds me of another uh, really good question that's happening right that, that, that uh, we're seeing in the news right now. Part of the bill, and we don't know if this is going to be in the final version that passes or what they're going to be able to do to implement this, but one of the things that government is taking advantage of this is the opportunity for is to institute a digital dollar system and get rid of paper money and coins. Now, I'm actually for that. I think it's kind of archaic that we still use cash, but I get the value of that. I use cash for uh, for things where I don't want to be traced, or I don't want some digital record of what I'm doing. Now, with crypto, if you can have uh, a money that you are able to access and use anonymously, then there's, there's no reason to have cash, right? Um, now, some people might say, well, no, no, I still I don't trust those networks. Well, the thing is, right now, you can't trust them because we live in a world where these giant governments are able to spy on us and, and even get some of that data. And that's really scary that we don't have uh, freedom of money to be able to use it to, to, to you know, do what we want to do with it without getting tracked or, or anything else. But the idea of, of paper, physical money in the age of the internet, it really is archaic. And as a vector for disease, it really is a serious problem. I'm, I'm, I think this is, it, it's, it's a good thing for humanity that we stop using physical money and that we go to all digital, but now not, not all, not mandated. Yeah, there's probably still always gonna be a role for reserve of, of physical money of some kind, of, of silver coinage, of uh, you know gold certificates, or you know, there are a lot of clever things that, that, that were being done uh, you know, years ago in the Ron Paul days when Ron Paul was putting a lot of attention on monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. Uh, I still have a, it's like a credit card where, and, and right in the middle, there's this transparent part uh, with two sheets of plastic. And in between that, a, a little flat sheet of gold. And it's like a, a tenth of a gram or something. And so it's, can, it's something that can be used in a, in a practical way for currency. All right, so we got another good comment here from my brother, Andrew, I want to read here. He says, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Seattle. People still want help with their meds, which I'm happy to provide as safely as I can. By the way, lunch hour is over and I'm back to it. Love you, bro. Thank you so much, Andrew. Really grateful that you could join us today. So uh, we had another one here. Uh, about our list. I want to I want to make sure we touch on this and remind people that in the text of the of, of this broadcast, please check that out. The we are not afraid hashtag campaign. I'm going to be sharing this every day, at least with this live video and on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I think it's really important that we keep that pressure up, that there's some means of empowering people to speak out, stand up and fight back against the curve of tyranny that we're experiencing. Alonzo Frank writes, great demand list. If you're idle, there is no better time to call your elected rep and make these demands. We should dictate terms and conditions. Yes, absolutely. This is the chance to stand up. Now, if you want instant organization, join Ron Paul's Campaign for Liberty. They will teach you how to punk a politician and make them do what you want. Campaignforliberty.org. Happy to promote that organization. I haven't been keeping up with them, but what they were doing uh, when I was, I was last keeping up with them was a, a very effective way of getting people to connect with elected representatives in a way that keeps that threat out there. And a lot of you think, well, why, why beg for freedom? Well, and it's an unfortunate quirk of our current system that you kind of have to do that in some situations, but it's also bringing the electoral threat. And right now, if I thought it was worthwhile, if, if, if I thought there was a chance to stop it or modify it, I would be asking, uh, asking people to call their senators and congressmen to say, don't vote for the spending bill if it includes any bailouts for big businesses and, and, and government agencies and yada yada. But it, and it's not so that you call them and they change behavior necessarily, but you say, if you do this, I will vote you out next time. I will organize against you next time. And it's it's just a vocalization of that political pressure and it brings that attention and shows people an opportunity how to hold them, uh, people uh, sorry, I just got a text from our friend who said, I was told to ask if you got the Rona. Is that, that's what Eden is calling it now. The Rona. Do you have the Rona? The Rona. The Rona. All right. So if there are no other urgent, okay. So not Scott, Newt, Newt Scott Lindsley, uh, thoughts on the mass of people coming in off the Tulsi Bernie side of things, 
seeking independent candidates to support. Yeah, and by the way, uh, if you watched our debate with Brian Ellison yesterday, highly recommend that. Big focus of his campaign is reaching out to the left, and I agree with him that we have the greatest chance for growth in that sector politically right now. I still think strategically it's more important that we really go for the middle, we go for the victory, we go to get uh, all of America on board with the libertarian platform and the libertarian uh, presidential nominee. But uh, what he points out in that interview is, is really important for being able to reach out to the left. So yes, I do think it is something that does deserve as a, a ideological, political, demographic, special attention from the libertarian movement right now. So uh, Sam, can we go to the, the history at this point? Um, Jeez, I don't know if we're even going to have time. It's it's ten minutes, and I, I still have a bunch of other things to cover here. But why don't should we, we get do, into it? We're going to hold it. Why don't we do this, and we'll do an entire video and segment on the history. All right, so of maybe pandemics. Maybe for this weekend, when things slow down a little bit, we'll do uh, one of our one of our videos this weekend. We'll do a pandemic history. So stay tuned. And again, please share these videos. If you're watching right now, if you like what you're hearing, if you think that this is important information and a valuable perspective. Again, a cool, calm, collected perspective, bringing people together as a community to deal with these crises in a rational way. I think it's really important that we grow this conversation. So please share this video right now. Share this video when it's over. Whatever it is, bring people into the conversation. If there's something else you think is more important, share that. It is so critical that as a global community and local communities that we share critical information to keep each other safe. So I want to talk about face masks. Right now we have a face mask crisis where even the healthcare professionals in this country aren't able to get them. Now, again, let's blame the paranoia here because people rushing out to get face masks and hoarding supplies is a result of the blown up market demand where people are going, oh my gosh, I'm going to need a face mask to survive the apocalypse or to be able to function in society in the age of Corona. And so now healthcare professionals in the United States are having a shortage. Again, the government response, the media response, hyping this up is making it harder for us to actually deal with the people who are vulnerable. For those of you who have been following me for a number of years, who remember everything that we did to make the book bomb happen, how we've raised money for printing copies of Freedom and getting them out, being able to give them away for free while touring all over the country, you would know my books are printed in China because they are so much cheaper. And it is a real sad quirk of uh, American corporatism driving up the costs. Real simple example. I'd, I'd rather buy local. I'd, I'd rather buy uh, in the United States at least. I'd rather not uh, have shipping my books across the Pacific Ocean built into the cost of bringing the message of freedom to you. But the cost in the United States would have been three times as much per book even without the shipping built into the cost. So today, actually, sorry, last night, I got an email from my printer in China saying that they have access to face masks. So we're thinking, hey, let's get some face masks over here. What I've considered doing is putting in an order for $5,000 worth of face masks, and that's what I'm getting quotes for right now. I think if there is a demand, crowdfunding for that would be relatively easy. Now, I was talking to my friend Quinn Aker uh, about this, and, and for those of you who don't know, Quinn, he is the uh, the the what is his title for the he is he is the man behind everything everything the Garden of Eden <laughs> and a uh, wonderful facility also in the Dallas area and what uh, he he actually brought this to my attention right before I saw this email from my printer in China that he had access to to importing masks as well. And what we might be able to expose here is like, look, libertarian activist is able to get $5,000 worth of masks imported from China like that, while the government is saying, no, we can't even take care of our, our healthcare workers. It would really expose the deliberate stifling of a rational response to this. So we're considering getting a, uh, a, a shipment of masks in from China. Uh, it would certainly be more effective than bandanas and, uh, and a lot more convenient and, able, and, and we'd be able to distribute those and share them with people maybe uh, all, all over this little tour, although I don't think they're going to get here soon enough. So we might do a crowdfunder, and, and one of the ideas that, that Quinn had, and uh, if, if, I, if I see the opportunity and there's the man, I just might, you know, this is 
Uh, I got to give him credit really for the idea on this one. Uh, I know I might just, you know, hand off my contacts and this opportunity to him. But the idea that, that he came up with was to do a crowdfunder for this. Say the price point for importing a, a trunk of masks for us is $5,000. You know, so we put a crowdfunder together and say, look, buy one, donate one. If, if you buy one, if, if, if you give us a dollar, well, you give us whatever the price point is, maybe you get five masks. Uh, Quinn told me last night they're selling masks at, a, at an inflated price. Even on Amazon, you, you have to spend $35 on a five pack, $7 each. For for what? How much does it cost to make one of those, David Sam? What do you think? Like ten cents? Uh, not much. Two cents in China? I mean, it's it's something on that scale. It depends on the type of mask. But right, right. But the, yeah. the basic N95 fabric with it with a white edge, top and bottom. You know, just mm -hmm. framed it so it doesn't fall apart, doesn't fray, and just the two little elastics. Right. I mean, it, it's it's like pennies. Yeah, pennies yeah. to produce so the fact that they're selling those now for seven dollars each is uh, a sign of the demand that we have for them right now and uh, you know who knows how long the demand is going to last if we're going to be able to get them here in time again uh i'm still pretty confident that uh you know things are going to be leveling out here within a couple months again could always be wrong could be something else that comes up here could be uh, a whole new virus that they use to scare us and you might not just be allowed in public in the united states from now on without a face mask on here's an interesting wrinkle to that by the way in a lot of places in the united states that's illegal yeah. being in public with your face covered and different municipalities have different codes about this I read a great story about about it on reason.com yesterday there's of course the exception that some of them say if you're under 16 years of age and I, for halloween right uh, or if it's for a costume party or a theatrical purpose or whatever the case may be but in a lot of places in the united states it's illegal to go out with your face covered. This was an issue when it came to women of different religions from the Middle East. Right, uh, with the hijab, of course. Mm -hmm. Naturally, that uh, some people, for religious reasons, as as women in you know uh, strict Muslim adherence, want to only go out with their faces covered, yeah. and it it, it 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 does scare a lot of people. Does it scare people more than the virus? We'll see. We're also looking into the 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 the, uh, the possibility of getting face masks with the Freedom logo printed on them. How cool would that be? And it's so funny that this came out because uh, as a possibility, our, our wonderful press secretary, Marcus Pulis, has been developing some graphics with, uh, there, are you, I think I shared the one with, with Malcolm X, right? It's Malcolm X with, uh, with a face mask that says freedom on it. So if there's any interest in that, please let me know. We're, we're going to get the estimate here to see how many masks we can get in the next couple days. Quinn is much better set up to do the, 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 the mail and, and distribution for this. But if we have a team of people joining us at, uh, at the Garden of Freedom next week in, at our, our bug out camp out we might have a uh you know the, the the support to be able to to handle that and distribute those and and get them out by mail so if uh you know it might be it might be worth it if even a month from now people are just more comfortable going out with face masks than without so let's get some freedom masks printed if there's some demand let me know and uh, when we get the estimate out, we'll put this out as a sort of pre-crowd funder who would be interested. And I would love to be able to sell Freedom, fa freedom Face Masks. I mean, how cool would that be? That. Right, so that's what we would do. If, 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 if we get an estimate and, and, and believe that it's possible uh, logistically and we have the demand, we'll set up a GoFundMe to raise that $5,000 or whatever that appropriate price point mm -hmm. is. Probably not much more than 5000 but I think that would be, you know, if it's... 5200 is the ultimate price point and we get you know such a greater quantity at that you know so i i think it would be reasonable for us to try to raise uh, about five thousand dollars uh right now for that so this could be a really exciting form of civil disobedience that's pretty unobjectionable right now and in the past people have said oh yeah you can't go out with a mask you could be up to no good well now it's if you go out without a mask you could be up to no good so uh, yeah newt scott Lindsay, instead of don't trout on me don't breathe on me i've seen so that's a fun one yeah the, the uh, gadsden flag graphic of the rattlesnake it says don't don't cough on me it's got a rattlesnake wearing uh wearing wearing one of the masks so that's pretty cool to see uh one other positive story i want to bring you all today the allegheny is that how you say it allegheny Allegheny, Allegheny County in New York State, uh, the militia there is distributing meals to people in need. And again, just a great example of a libertarian 
excuse me, a libertarian solution stepping in when government fails. Government says, hey, this is what you, what you have to do, but we're not going to take care of you if you're vulnerable. What they're doing is going out and delivering meals to people who are in quarantine or in isolation to protect themselves, people who are elderly and vulnerable. Now, again, about that, and I've been thinking about this, this is really, I think, the last holdout of the fear mongering right now is that you might hurt an old person. You know, if you're a carrier, if you're careless, uh, an old person might get this. And we want to make sure that old people don't get it until we have uh, a better understanding of what this is, or we have a solid treatment regimen that doesn't uh, you know, have, have unnecessary side effects or, or, or things like that. But even that, I, you know, and again, I, I'm willing to accept with the data that we have right now that it's still a possibility this virus represents a, a truly outsized threat to old people. But, you know, again, if you said, you know, what, what's the fatality rate of going for a walk, right? Bear with me. If, uh, if a million people go for a walk, and uh, a couple of them die in that hour while they're out walking, how much you want to bet it skews towards the older population. And just any kind of health strain, you're going to see a natural death curve that follows, as we're seeing with the uh, statistics for corona. Yes, it's going to affect old people more than young people. And if it comes down to that, uh, I think we're going to see that statistic reduce pretty radically as well. Uh, but for the time being, this is the one thing that really has me uh, you know, supporting the the uh, extraordinary lengths that people are going to now to to isolate to quarantine to really uh, you know in a, in a temporary way uh, scale up their their hygiene and their germ consciousness. Um, speaking of discrediting government, what did they do about gun violence? They created gun free zones. How do they create gun free zones? They put up signs in front of schools that said this is a gun free zone. So the answer from government here is really obvious. We just need signs in front of every building that says, this is a virus-free zone, and the virus will be gone in no time. I think they have those in some emergency rooms. <laughs> actually. Does it work there? I don't know. So again, to the, to the Italian problem, I know some people are thinking, but Adam, but Adam, what about Italy? What about Italy? Again, Statistics, they are definitely being overblown. I've seen the videos of hospitals being uh, overloaded, and I'm not really convinced. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still very skeptical because a lot of these are, you know, media trickery where they show one, one room with uh, with 16 people who, who are on ventilators or, um, you know, getting medical treatment in, in an ICU. But it's not like I, I haven't seen. Uh, now, again, please, if you're watching this, if you've seen something else, if you've seen any other evidence of a truly widespread, a massive problem of people needing hospitalization from the coronavirus, please, t right now, put it in the comments. Tell me what you've seen. If I saw a field hospital, and this is, again, the one legitimate use of the US military in this time is sharing medical resources that they have. And, and they've actually um, put out a call today for uh, retired military personnel in certain healthcare fields to possibly come back to active duty in order to help with this. Uh, might just be a military precaution to take care of the troops, who knows. But if I saw a field hospital, for example, mm -hmm. full of patients, and we would see this in Italy, right? Italy, Italy has a huge military too, right? They have field hospitals that they could be setting up big tents. They could have, they have, they have auditoriums, right? They have stadiums. They have multi-purpose rooms. They, they have all of these facilities outside of hospitals that they would be using to treat this overflow of patients if it was really at that level. I haven't seen it yet. David, Sam, have you seen anything like that no. as, as direct evidence that would really show, even in Italy, that there's a high hospitalization rate? Now, I'm not saying there isn't a surge of patients and that there isn't something to be feared for. You know, if we don't flatten the curve, it could get out of hand. But again, let's get people doing the right thing with accurate information, not with lying to them. Because if you do that, the next time you're the boy who cried wolf. So... Stephanie O'Day says, my mom's hospital, Beaumont in Royal Oak, they're turning people away. Now, again, if you look at that in isolation as a data point, Stephanie, okay, their hospital's turning people away. Well, in a sense, we got turned away from getting tested here because they just said, we're not testing anybody over 65, whether they have symptoms or not, unless they need immediate treatment. So if they're turning people away, it might be people like us who probably didn't have corona, 
just a little corona phobia and you know if, if that's the case uh we really have to read between the headlines and question everything so stephanie uh are they i, I assume now stephanie if you told me they're turning people away and they're dying in piles on the sidewalk people outside of the hospital the i'd be like so. yeah right are they turning people away uh, who need uh, to get on a ventilator that's or who needs said. serious treatment. Okay, so if that's what it is, that's different. And that would, okay, people that need ventilators are being turned away. So why would they turn away people who have ventilators if all they, if they could still give them a bed? You know, like go, go, you need a ventilator, but go die alone at home. We're not even give you a bed to treat what we can without a ventilator. You know, I, I, I don't mean to just be dismissing everything, but you know, Stephanie, show me pictures. I, 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 I'm, I'm not seeing it as out of control as they're blowing it up to be. And I think it's really important. Again, question everything right now. Question me. Question what I'm bringing you. If, if it doesn't make sense, if it's not in line with what you're observing, find the truth. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful that so many of you are joining us every day now and, and trusting us to bring you a better version of the truth than what you're getting from the mainstream media. So I think that's, uh, that's all I've got to cover today. Again, the we are not afraid text please share that with uh, with the hashtag we are not afraid um make your own version let it mutate go viral but let's give some but let's let's give everybody a, a way to stand up and, and fight back and feel empowered even sitting at home in quarantine or isolation right now we are going on the corona virus excuse me the corona phobia bug out tour starting saturday working our way from austin to dallas to denver to phoenix to san diego to los angeles to vegas and then home to juniper wood so if you can uh if you're in any of those cities and you can help us out with supplies we are looking at building a team in in uh, you know, our emergency apocalypse bug out team, we have a number of people who want to join us already who are going to be caravanning with us. If you want to be a part of that, please send me an email and uh, let me know what you bring to the table. With that being said, you can also donate, and that's in the post below on my Facebook page, BTC, BCH, USD, through PayPal. Email me if there's any other way you want to contribute. It's been awesome to have so many people chipping in, even uh, a lot of uh, $10, $20 donations right now hugely critical and, and, and what that means even you know ten dollars with what if, if that's another uh you know, you know a couple mres for someone that's one more person who can come out to uh to the garden of freedom and and be food secure for the time that they're out there so that's that's a huge help really appreciate it uh, Rainbow Jones, randomacts.org has a drive for masks on now, the kind that we can make at home to cover the ones they have. The pattern is available. Awesome. Great information. Uh, randomacts.org. One more thing to plug. And with that note, please share this video. Share this message. Thank you so much for tuning in. Peace and love, y'all. We will talk to you tomorrow.